Welcome back to TLC, home of shows such as Sex Sent Me to the ER and Best Funeral Ever. These are real shows that were on TLC. You're watching 90 Day Fiance the other way. How are you going to afford it? it? I'm going to manifest it. Oh my gosh, she is a sick couple. How the world can kill the creations. But we're already really homesick. Touch me, hold my bones. You're my strange beautiful. Ah, uh, yep. Ah, uh, yep. Give me what I get you now. I'm gonna sit on him until he hands me these keys. Why can't men be educated enough not to harass women and not to look at them? <sighs> I feel this is a crazy American behavior. I speak the language of donkey, I think. You have like a mental sickness or something. If you know me or you've seen any of my videos, you know I am a stan for 90 Day Fiance. It's a not so guilty pleasure of mine and I've come to accept that. Which means while all of you are out at church being forgiven of your sins every Sunday, I'm at home watching 90 Day Fiance and stuffing my face and texting my mom about it. Now, if you aren't familiar with the 90 Day universe, I'm just gonna give you a quick overview. Basically, it's a reality TV series about American citizens and their foreign partners who have 90 days to decide whether or not they want to get married because that's how long the visa process takes. The show has multiple spin-offs, such as 90 Day Fiancé The Other Way, which shows the American partner flying to the foreign partner's country to potentially live and get married there. And this is the spin-off we are going to be focusing on today. More specifically, we'll be focusing on season four. And as an avid 90 Day Fiancé consumer, this season stuck out to me for many reasons. Reason number one, this season is the first season that a trans person has been on the show. We love representation of all people over here. Second, uh, more history in the making. We have the largest age gap. Yes, the largest age gap between couples, making them about 43 years apart, more or less. Gross, but it is a new record for the show. Not that that record needed to happen. Third, another LGBTQ plus representation, we have Chris and Jamie. Um, that is not why I'm acknowledging them though. Uh, they have probably the most confusing storyline I've ever seen. And you'll see what I mean. <coughs> Chris is crazy. <coughs> I'm sorry. I need some water. Fourth, one couple was brought to this spinoff from another spinoff called Love in Paradise. I told you there's so many spinoffs, I can't even keep up. And fifth, this was the worst tell-all in history of tell-alls. And if you don't know what the tell-all is, basically it's at the end when all the couples get together and they usually spill the tea, but that is not what happened this time. So yes, I am back in my commentary era and the amount of work it took to put into this video before even hitting the record button it reminds me why I don't do these often. So enjoy it while it lasts. But if you enjoy it, let me know and maybe I'll make more. Keep in mind, I'm trying to recap an entire season in a video. This video is going to be long. So let's dive into the season, shall we? To keep this video as somewhat structured as I can, we're just gonna focus on one couple at a time and then we'll talk about the tell-all at the end. Sound good? I keep wanting to look at the microphone like you're in there. Hey! When I discuss these couples, I'm just gonna kind of go over the more important things. If I miss anything, it's because I'm trying not to make this video five hours long. We'll start out with Isabel and Gabe because they are probably the least problematic couple on this season. So Gabe is 32 years old. He is from Florida and he is the trans person that I mentioned earlier. He is once female to now male. He owns his own underwear business where he inserts bulges into underwear to help other trans female to male people feel more comfortable in their bodies, which I think is pretty cool. He actually took a work trip to Colombia to find a manufacturer, which is how he met Isabel. She's a 34 year old single mother of two children. She is gorgeous. They fall in love and now he's moving to Colombia to propose to her and start a whole new life. However, her parents don't know he's trans. They also threw in the segment of Gabe having a friend that Isabel didn't like and it kind of started started to show me Gabe's weird crave for unnecessary drama. Hey then. So you know, this is usually our spot, bro. Where me Thanks. and you hang out. Porque No, es bien. I'm... 
It's bien, it's bien, it's bien. No. Like, like, it's not like she can understand what he's saying, first of all. Second of all, that just made her suspicious. If I were in her shoes, I would be suspicious too. That was so unnecessary, but whatever. I'll let it pass. Eventually, Gabe comes out to her parents. They accept him. It's very cute, very wholesome. He does a very thoughtful proposal where he paints a little pottery kit with her children, asks her children for their permission to marry her. They said yes. He takes Isabel to that same pottery place with the same plate that he made with the kids, proposes to her. It's really thoughtful. Enter Monica. Monica is Gabe's sister. She comes off as kind of mean. We learn that him and his sister can't really communicate well, and this is going back to the point where I think Gabe just really enjoys stirring the pot a little bit. His sister arrived in Colombia to attend the wedding. She kind of came in with an attitude. You don't speak no English. Girl, you're in Colombia. The main language in Colombia, to my knowledge, is Espanol. So the fact that you didn't even do any Duolingo or anything. Siento que Monica quiere incomodarme por el tema del inglés. Me gusta mucho que estén aquí. So there's por two ways también. to get up this ¿Tú mountain. puedes, por favor, ayudarme? Sí. <laughs> I know that look. Sí. Que yo también estoy muy feliz que ya están aquí. Me too. Por fin. Finally. Finally. <laughs> what do you mean, finally? I don't know what the deal is with her, but fast forward to the wedding. Apparently the night before the wedding, Gabe and Monica were at a bar and Isabel was supposed to meet them there, but was running late because she's doing wedding stuff the night before her wedding, reasonably. By the time Isabel gets there, Monica wants to leave. So I told Monica that she's the one that creates problems in my relationships. I can't believe it's turned into such a big thing for her not even to come to my wedding. Overall though, Isabel is probably one of my favorite cast members. She's just an angel. There's not a lot of like decent people on these shows from what I've seen. So to see that is just like a breath of fresh air. And her family, her family is just so sweet. Ugh. Moving on to Danielle and Johan. So this is the couple from Love and Paradise. They're already married. Danielle, who met her now husband, Johan, in the Dominican Republic. She's moving to the Dominican Republic to be with him permanently. However, the plot twist is that she did not tell him that. He's under the impression that she's only coming for about a year or so to wait for the spousal visa to go through in America. And so he thinks that she's just coming so they can be together while that visa thing is happening so they don't have to do long distance anymore. And and yeah, no, she's like, Yo quiero vivir aquí. Tú no me dijiste. Tú dijiste que quería yo no alquilar un apartamento por un año. Hasta que yo tuviera visa. And you slowly start to learn that Danielle really just wants things her way or no way. And that's final. Danielle gets there. She brings like 20 suitcases, which is so funny because she told her friends that she was only bringing like two suitcases. And you're bringing one, un, una maleta. No, dos. Plot twist, she brings 20 or like 10. So he goes to pick her up at the airport and she's shocked to see him in the same car that he always has because she has 10 suitcases. But she didn't tell him that she was bringing 10 suitcases. ¿Tiene espacio para todo? No. Vamos a subir la maleta acá. I didn't tell Johan that I had 10 suitcases. I'm surprised that when Johan picks me up, he shows up in a four door and not a van. So it's obviously his fault. Like what logic does that make? You have to communicate. Hey, I'm moving here. So I'm gonna have a little bit more luggage than usual, like 10 suitcases. If you could get a bigger car, that'd be great. And th that problem solved. I should be a marriage counselor. There's this whole scene with Johan wanting to own his own butcher shop and like he's very excited about it. And Danielle just comes in with her little laptop and is like, you need to manage your finances. Yo no Warren Buffett. Come to find out, thanks to Reddit, Danielle filed for bankruptcy. So I just thought that was interesting. <laughs> Let the man have his meat business. It did look gross though, I will say. Then on their one year anniversary or one year anniversary from when they met. I really, I was confused about this part. It's their anniversary. It's the day before Johan's birthday. They're out for a drink. Today is the one year anniversary from when Johan and I first met. Don mi amigo está aquí. Qué amigo. Talon. El que tú tuviste novio. Él quiere uh, ir a un almuerzo con los dos. Yo quiero tú siente cómodo. Mira, y no me voy a sentir cómodo. Tú puedes atentar. Cuando una persona es importante a mí, es importante, te gusta él, porque tú es más importante. De verdad que me quille quillado con eso. Johan makes it very, very clear that, you know, he's not comfortable with that. And instead of her compromising and being like, oh, I can understand that. You know, I just wanted to check with you. I value your opinion. And if you change your mind, let me know. But instead, you know, she's like, you have to change the way you're thinking because I want you to feel important and heard, but also I want my way. So you have to do what I say so I can get my way. So change the way you feel. 
So fast forward next day, it's Johan's birthday. She tries to throw him a surprise party. And when he doesn't thank her during his little speech, she storms off. Excuse me. Un día antes de mi cumpleaños, sí. tú me dices, los amigos tú tuviste relaciones con él. ¿Cómo tú crees que yo me siento? Tú no sabes nada. Yo no sé no nada qué. So of course, because Danielle doesn't compromise, she meets up with her ex-boyfriend anyway. They talk about Johan, and then she finally convinces Johan to meet up with this guy, and it doesn't go well, obviously, because he didn't want to meet up in the first place. Yo no me vestiré así ni muerto. Ok, cama, estando. Ah, uh, 6'5. 6'5. 6'5. ¿Cuánto tu calza? 14. 14. Ah, sí. Y yo. <laughs> Daniela le gusta hombre con pene grande. <laughs> No, tú querías yo conociera a tu amigo, tú querías yo le hago pregunta, yo le voy a hacer toda la pregunta que yo quiera. ¿Por qué tú lloras? Porque yo pienso que tú no tienes confianza en yo. Johan actually meets up with him separately to play basketball, ask him questions about Danielle, more so about her controllingness. I don't know if that's a word either. That's kind of where things end off. From what I remember, I've been like re-watching all of this except for like the last three episodes, so bear with me. Next we have Nicole and Mahmoud. So again, we have an already married couple. So Nicole is 38 years old. She looks great. She's very much into fashion design and resale clothing. Speaking of resale clothing, in the cut off shop plug, check it out. She took a spiritual related trip to Egypt, met this guy at a fabric store. His name is Mahmoud. I will most likely pronounce his name different every single time I say it because it's one of those names, you know? I'm trying my best. They hung out for a few days while she was in Egypt. She flew back to LA. Couldn't have been more than five days after I was back in America where he he asked me if, if I really would uh, come to Egypt and marry him. So seven days after that, she flew back to Egypt and they got married and she didn't tell anybody. So they got married, she converted a Muslim and she lived there for about two months before she said, I hate this place, I want to leave. And so she left back to LA and now she's moving back to Egypt. Uh, it's, a, it's a whole thing, really. I don't know. Nicole's one of those people that I just, I can't really get a good read on her. She seems like a nice girl, but like she doesn't think through things, I feel. On top of that, they have this reoccurring fight about her clothing because as mentioned earlier, she converted to Muslim. Her husband translates that to, you are going to cover your body head to toe because that's what we do. We fight endlessly for hours about what I can and cannot wear. And that's why she left in the first place and she thought, hey, maybe if I move back, that just won't exist this time. And of course she gets there, first thing that happens. Okay, my love, can you just close your jacket, please? <laughs> why? Because I think your chair is more small or something. So Stand. rude. The jacket wasn't covering, like, my friends. But the thing that I notice about this couple the most is how awkwardly over affectionate they are towards each other, especially like just at the weirdest moments. Like they'll be in the middle of an argument and Mahmoud will be like, okay, honey, I love you. I'm sorry, okay? Okay, my love. I love you. I love but like, talk. okay, my love. Too. I love you so much. I love you. I love you, honey. I love you too. I okay, can we do that tomorrow? Yeah, we're gonna fix it. I love you. You know what I'm say? I was waiting till you finished talking. I love you too. <laughs> okay, I love you so much, honey. Thank you. I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. Honey bun. But uh, then they decide to go swimming. They ask you how you are, you just have to say that you're fine when you're not really fine, but you just can't get I guess right after that they get into an argument on the street. It's giving domestic violence a little bit. I don't know what he's like in private, but the fact that he acts weird off camera, like the way she said it was off camera, makes me wonder how he actually is off camera. While the cameras weren't rolling, I walked up to Mahmoud and he was acting funny and I asked him what's wrong and he said something passive aggressive to me like, like you care anyway. I don't know why he said it, but I think it was totally uncalled for. Can you stop now? And uh, I, I just, I've had enough. I don't understand why you don't exist now. Why I get to you now? It's your whole attitude, like everything what about I get you. you. Tell me what I did. About you. Tell me what I did now. Everything about you. Tell right me what now. I did to you now. Tell me exactly what I did. No, no just no, what I, I said. Don't even remember. Just leave me the f alone. I'm tired of you. I'm tired of it. Nothing's oh. not good enough for you ever. Go find some other. Don't do that. To me, okay? Let me go. I don't want to talk to you anymore. Like, I just want you to leave me alone. Okay, go alone. 
I love you, honey. He just, he freaks me out a little bit. And then we have the queen, probably my favorite person on 90 Day Fiance in general, Naran. Nicole met Naran during a yoga class and they were chatting it up and Nicole was like, wow, she seems like she actually has freedom. And then that's when she just started to realize it's actually just her husband who's making her do this and it's not really like traditional everywhere in Egypt. So she thinks it's a good idea to have Naran meet her husband and it was totally a good idea. This is how Egyptian beauty will see. So now you're blaming the wrongdoings of men on Nicole or on women. So because men are looking and staring and fantasizing, then women should accommodate to that. Men have like, don't look to women and the woman have to cover her body. Oh, I am covered. Or do I have to cover every part of skin? Yes, this was clear. Oh, no, it's not Quran. clear. Can you please tell me a verse in the Quran that says this? I can show you. When a God created us, why didn't create we are all half pops? Because we need to feed the babies. You think the boobs are there just to turn guys on? The worst girl ever I met in my life, I think. I love you, honey. I love you too. And your friend is so nice. <laughs> Naran, please accept this crown. Just a quick little observation on TLC's editing team. Hey, what are you guys doing? You guys take edibles before you edit or, or what's going on? <laughs> There's a scene where him and his brother go to this like all men's cafe to play dominoes or something. Nicole is literally in the background at this all men's cafe. You can try to blur her out, but but we can see her. <laughs> Fast forward again, there's a scene of her finding out that he was chatting with a woman in China. How old are you? What are you doing? And did you make it back to your hotel okay last night? Why you go to my phone? And the way he handles it is just extremely immature, very much, oh, did I do that? And that's where we leave off with them. Let's just get this over with. I'm not gonna spend much time here. Jen and Rishi, probably the most boring couple on this season. And you know, Jen seems like a nice girl for the most part. Jen is a 46 year old woman from Oklahoma. She took a solo trip to India and met Rishi, who is a 32 year old personal trainer and model. He proposed to her after a month of them knowing each other and she had to go back to the US. Then COVID happened and it's been a couple years since they've seen each other. They've been engaged this whole time. So now she's going back to India to be with her man and to potentially get married. Except she's not. She's not getting married and I could tell from the start. We've seen this before. If you don't watch 90 Day Fiance often, you probably won't know who they are, but Jenny and Summit have entered the chat. Hello. You know, it just seems like a very much repeated storyline. Shocker, Rishi's family doesn't know that he proposed to Jen because he doesn't think they'll accept her because she's older, she's American, and she doesn't want to live with the family. And that's like a tradition in India where they live in a joint family household. And his family is actually looking for a bride for him for an arranged marriage. And Jen finds out about this and she's pissed. But then she gets over it. And then there's Jen's friend, Randy. Good old Randaruski. And I can't remember her other friend's name, but. Cheers, lady. Oh, cheers. Yes. Cheers. cheers. So. To good, good. friends. Yes. Seeing you guys. Yes. I can't help but think of like the Hocus Pocus ladies when I see them. Randy comes up with this genius idea to catfish Rishi. I think she just kind of wants to be involved. So she sends Reese Reese's? I'm hungry. She sends Reese. <laughs> Can I talk? She sends Rishi a message and he sends her a picture with his shirt off. I'm not a huge Rishi fan. I, if my man did that, I'd be like, hey, bye. Hey, you wanna do that? Peace. Um, but Jen confronts him, of course, he's like, <laughs> what are you talking about? I didn't do that. You send her a pic of you in a towel? I took this message from my post and I send them. So then Jen's friends decide to come visit and they do and they talk to Rishi and yet another bad editing cut for TLC. Are your editors paying attention? I can, if y'all are looking for editors, hello. I edit all my videos. If y'all are looking for somebody, hit me up. Th there's like a scene where Jen walks away and it's like showing Randy like, I think one of us should go check on Jen. I'm surprised that you haven't, but I'll do it. So Jen and her friends hire a translator. They go to Rishi's house to meet with his mom and his uncle. And basically Randy decides to tell his family for Jen that they're engaged because Rishi doesn't want to do it. Jen doesn't want to do it. And so Randy's like, I'll do it. I am a certified interventionist. On the surface, Jen's mom's like, oh, cool. Okay, fine. You know, you're in love, you're happy, whatever. Once Jen and the friends leave though, she's like, uh, how old is she? He says she's 48 
and I thought she was 46, but I maybe they filmed it at a different time. I don't know. And then immediately they're like, no, nope, she's too old for you. Like, that's too big of an age difference. Speaking of age difference, let's talk about Debbie and Osama. That's pretty much where they left off anyway, so we'll move on. All right, we have Miss Debbie, 67 year old woman in Georgia. She's an artist and she sells jewelry, and she met her Prince Charming Osama on social media. He is 24 years old. He's an artist and a poet, and they bonded through their artwork, and after they talked for about six months, she flew to Morocco to meet him and spend time with him. She flew back to the US, and when she came back, he was like, hey, actually, come be my wife. And so that's what she's doing. So Debbie gets there, she's swept off her feet and in love, and then she finds out that Osama actually thinks she's only staying for a few months and then going back to the US and not actually moving here. And so that brings them to their first debacle, as Gabe would say. Debacle. You want me to go back to the States? Ah, uh, yep. You really screwed up big time, Osama. Why? It's like shame on you. Why? Because I said the truth. You lied because to me. Because I'm still, I'm still want to marry you. I don't believe you anymore. However, they end up talking it over, and he wins her back over with a poem. Touch me, all my bones, my heart, and everything breathe inside me. Ah, uh, wasn't that sweet? Debbie and Osama go to his farm to meet his family. They say something about him going to the U.S., and Debbie's just like, huh? So they're on their way to go paint some pictures and there's this scene with Debbie and this donkey. Purdy, my purdy. I speak the language of donkey, I think. Okay, Osama, slow down, please. My, I don't have a butt. God didn't give me a butt, Osama! <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, they go to paint, and Debbie's trying to talk about, you know, what, what's actually going on, and he gets pissed. We need to have plans for our future. Yeah, I mean, I will not do everything in one day. Are you crazy? You have that mental sickness or something. What? Safe times. What's yeah. going on with this lady? So your real plan is just come get to the visa, get to the United States, and that's that's it for you. That's that's how it goes. You will bring me to the USA, can guarantee my future there. You're you're creepy, man. Yes. I'm creepy, I'm bad, I'm ugly, I'm mother I'm son of a bitch, okay? And honestly, that was kind of where things started to go downhill and you know sometimes people on the show tend to put up with people like that like a lot of especially like the older american women are just like not really realize they're being scammed and she was like you know what i know the flags when i see them i'm out of here get me a cab peace they meet up to talk about it one last time and she is just very unimpressed talk to the hand he's also surprised that cafes don't have margaritas do you have any texas margarita we have a tea and we have a coffee it's a desert for margaritas out here and that was kind of the last of it they go their separate ways <sighs> Okay, I needed to take a deep breath before I go into this next couple because I've never been so angry watching this show. We have Jamie and Chris. Chris is a 40 year old woman from Alabama and at the beginning they paint her to look like this very free spirited, weird, quirky woman. Kind of like, I thought she was gonna be more like Debbie. She's running around these costumes, onesies. Yeah, no, I don't know what that was about. So basically Chris has been married twice both to men and it just didn't work out. She said she's always been bisexual so she wanted to start dating women and she met Jamie. Jamie is 30 years old. She is originally from Venezuela but she moved to Colombia because they're a little bit more accepting of gay relationships there and she could be more herself. I know like sex for men is hurt and I never have organs. And honestly, again, Jamie is one of those people that I'm just like, a oh, breath of fresh air. She's amazing, I love her. So they met on a dating site, and after about one month of talking online, Chris told Jamie that she wanted to marry her. And Chris moves to Colombia to marry Jamie. During their time dating online, there was a period of time where Chris just ghosted Jamie for about a month. So like any other person who was dating someone online and then just got ghosted, Jamie's thinking, okay, I don't know when I'm gonna hear from this person again, we're done. She starts talking to another woman from Texas. Then the woman from Texas reached out to Chris. It was a whole thing. Chris reached back out to Jamie. They got back together, basically. And Chris holds that against her because she thinks it's cheating, but it's like you literally went no contact for a month. Make it make sense. 
So Chris supposedly owns two houses and one of them burned down for some reason. And she's trying to renovate the one that burned down so she can rent it out. Then we find out that Chris has narcolepsy. I was diagnosed with narcolepsy. Right. I remember when I first watched this, I was like, okay, that's this will be interesting. I've never seen someone have a narcolepsy like sleep episode and I never will because it's really not brought up much after they talk about it in the first like few episodes. And then we come to find out that Chris actually actually has a lot of health related issues and just issues in general. So Chris gets to Columbia and Chris is mad because the apartment that Jamie picked out is $100 more than what she had asked for. Keep in mind, Chris told Jamie to move. I need this, I need that, I need American kitchen. You know, I need these things if I'm gonna live with you so I can feel comfortable. She gets there and Jamie has this cute little setup for her. They get together and then we find out that Chris also has night terrors. I can have night terrors. You might end up getting karate kicks in the sleep. <laughs> then we find out she's also allergic to mint, so she can't have regular toothpaste. She has to have bubblegum flavored toothpaste. I have a really bad neck and a bad back. I broke my neck in a car accident and Seven days later, I was rear-ended again, going home from the hospital. No, 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 I'm bitch, it's a water for this. I need surgery, but I chose not to have it. We also find out that she collects knives. Oh, that big knife? I received one just like that for my birthday when I turned eight. Genial, yo recibí una Barbie. Tiene narcolepsia, accidentes de vehículo, y ya dos días de conocerla, ahora tiene pesadillas, quiere portar armas, y necesita una cirugía complicadísima. And we're just getting started. Then we find out that she has a rare motorcycle that got stolen that supposedly is worth $50,000 and she might need to fly back to Alabama to go to court, which would have been during their wedding date. A man broke into my garage and stole my rare motorcycle. Now, Jamie is rightfully upset because what the fuck? Why, are, why is all of this stuff coming up out of nowhere? However, uh, she ended up not having to go back to court, so she made up a different excuse to go back to Alabama. But we'll get there in a second. Jamie is doing everything in her power to please this woman and keep her sanity. Baby, and the flea market right now. I don't think I can get out to even look at the flea market right now. Pasó varias horas en el avión y pues no puede con el dolor de cuello. Luego colocar una inyección. Oh, also in all of this mess, they do get married. Going back to the finance stuff, Chris told Jamie that she could quit her job and that she'll take care of the finances. She has enough money saved up. She can take care of the bills and everything. I told Jamie that since I was selling my home, that I would make sure that the bills were covered. I know quick for my job, maybe you need help. I, it's okay, I come back to work. We're gonna be fine covering bills for a while. We can just use the money that I have. I am happy to pay all the bills. Jamie's just like, okay. Jamie did not ask for this. She just simply accepted an offer. Then Chris is claiming that her bank account got frozen. My bank froze my account because they thought somebody stole my identity. I have no desire to just go to work somewhere. Jamie and I have been talking to different people about looking at food trucks. Another random thing that we never hear anything about ever again, they look at food trucks and then they don't buy one. Her other excuse to go back to Alabama is, I've been having so many problems with my bank. And now on top of that, when I went to get my narcolepsy medicine refilled, I found out they don't have it here. So she ignored Jamie for months while she was back in Alabama. I called you, I never answered. When I don't answer the phone, do you know what I'm doing? I'm working. She finally gives Jamie a call when she finds out Jamie has COVID because she had COVID in the past and she almost died from it. And it's only when Jamie might be on the verge of death when she decides to reach out, which is very fucked up. There's also a scene of her getting irrationally angry at her because all she wants is emotional support. And she takes that as, oh, you don't think I'm doing enough because I'm just working and sending you money. I was only supposed to be in Alabama for two weeks and here it's been three months. We were running out of money faster than even I thought. So I ended up staying longer so I could work and make money. At the time, I told her that if she wanted to quit, she could. I don't care how I need support for my work. Keep in mind this whole season, people are speculating that she is has like a drug problem, allegedly. 
And so then there's this scene with these armbands and a lot of people are just kind of like, hmm, hey, cute armbands, Chris, what are those for? Once I started paying attention to it a little bit more, I saw this scene with her mom. <sighs> Everything's crashing and burning. <laughs> I laugh to keep from crying. Crashing and burning in Bogota. That sounds like a good title. Uh, yeah, it, it was just very off-putting. I was kind of like, oh. So after all this time, Chris finally flies back to Colombia. After five months, I'm finally back in Bogota. I was supposed to be here a month ago, but my son got into some trouble and I could not leave Alabama. Obviously it's awkward. It's Jamie's birthday. They're swimming. They're having a good time. Weird way to jump into a pool with chronic neck pain, but hey, I don't know. The moment Jamie confronts Chris about everything, as one does when you've been gone for five months, Chris, of course, makes it about money. The house you got Chris is $150 more a month. I'm trying Lower to talk. your voice right now. En ese momento se venció una renta, ella la pagó. Y al siguiente mes pagó y luego dejó de pagar. No volvió a pagar. And then we see a side of Chris that is a little scary for Jamie. Get the away! Get Stop! Get away! Stop. Stop! Thank God she didn't have one of her knives because that could have been way worse than it was. So the thing about Jamie and Chris is... I try to understand, but I understand nothing. Chris's storyline is just like a roller coaster. It's all over the place. It doesn't make sense. I don't get it. So that brings us to the tell-all or the tell very little. Usually the tell-all is where the tea is spilt, the receipts are brought up, but this tell-all felt very different. Everything that we just talked about swept under the rug. And we even found out some more excuses from Chris during the tell-all, which is that she blacks out when she's angry. I black out. So is that supposed to validate your behavior of domestic violence or we're just gonna ignore that? Oh, we're just gonna ignore, oh, okay. We're, we're just gonna ignore it, I guess. No one says anything about that. Then there's this accusation that Jamie cheated on her three times and she brings that up in a completely random conversation. When I found out she was cheating on me for the second time, I left work mad and upset and I flipped my car and she was terrified because she knew that I could have died because of my health injuries. Okay, well, if you're getting blacked out while angry, maybe you don't operate a vehicle. You ever thought of that? She claims to have sent Jamie $10,000 when Jamie has receipts and it was only like 1,700 or something. And she also claims to have her phone taken away while working because Jamie was calling too much, which if you're working odd jobs, aren't you your own boss? Like, aren't you a contractor? Can't you just be like, hey, I'm working, I'll call you later? Barely anybody was sticking up for Jamie. Debbie actually stuck up for Chris and called Jamie a predator, very out of pocket. And it's very easy for a predator to take advantage of Chris. Are you calling Jamie a predator? Yes. Uh, hey, you're 67 years old, dating a 24 year old. Who is a predator here, girl? You was 40 when your man was being born. Is that not weird? I literally just had to refresh my memory and I skimmed through all three parts of the tell-all. It was almost as if the TLC producers told the cast to take it easy on her. Her being Chris. Because they did. Because she's unpredictable. And that is just not fair to the other cast members. If you're signing up for a reality TV show, you should know what you're getting yourself into. I'm also not really sure what the cast members are shown before the tell-all because it seems like they're only shown like little snippets. But then they showed a clip of Chris pushing Jamie and no one reacted. Oh, and Tim and Veronica were there. Ooh. I don't know who on TLC's team thinks it's a good idea to keep bringing in these commentators for a tell-all, but it's not necessary. We already have Pillow Talk. That's its own spinoff. Leave it alone. I feel like they were just brought in to fill in time because they knew this tell-all was going to be terrible because we can't dive into Chris's tornado story. Tim is just disgusting and... He basically just stereotypes Jamie based off of his experiences with Colombian women because he's an expert at Colombian women. I'm not gonna stereotype Colombian women, but out of all my different Colombian girlfriends, they will all- It's completely unfair to Jamie, and he basically just clumps all of Colombian women into one category. The main takeaways that I noticed in the tell-all that they acknowledged, we find out that Osama called Debbie thousands of times, and she did not answer. And then Julian comes out and tries to act all rough and tough. You in my world now. 
you lucky you ain't here. And Jen creams her pants. I love you. Wow. Yeah. I just love you. Okay. Wow. Then Gabe butts his head into Nicole and Mahmoud's relationship. Mahmoud freaks out. I'm done. When he's challenged, he walks away. Shut up, ass. Nicole cries and just says she wants world peace. I just want people to be nice to each other. Gabe's friend is there for some reason. <sighs> Sorry. Debbie called Rishi a coward. I think he was a coward. Uh, he need to go back because uh, he need to go back. It's like, no. Rishi's mom and uncle zoom in and basically the whole cast bullies Rishi into telling his mom, hey, I'm going to marry Jen whether you like it or not. All you have to say is, mom, I'm engaged. We're getting married. I Just because of you, all of you, like uh, you are pressuring over there. And the mom's like, haha, no. Randy and Myra show up and give their two cents on everything for some reason. With all due respect, I think that you emasculated Johan and I think you carried his balls in your purse. They talk about Gabe's penis. How does it work? I get my penis. For way too long. Like, we, we discussed this already in an episode. Why are we having a whole discussion about it again? Wasting time on a tell-all. Ridiculous. And then Chris tries to look like the good guy and is like, well, I would still be her sponsor. I'd bring her to America. Just like today, I, I would still help her move to oh America today. I would, I would sponsor I'm her crazy. to come here. No, you wouldn't. I just don't think it's possible with you. I would not want to rely on you. Oh, there was also something, there was like a part where Jamie said Chris cheated on her and her ex-boyfriend sent her photos and videos and stuff. And Chris's reaction was like, I went and kicked the door down and busted his phone. Tu ex novio me estaba enviando fotos de ella desnuda, teniendo sexo y demás. Then she told me that he was sending her all this stuff, so I went to his house and kicked the freaking door into his bedroom. Why do you have pictures of me? What are you doing sending them? I crushed his phone and I ran like hell. And then Chris and Jamie say their last words to each other. No matter what I say, she's going to have some remark to it. Jamie, any last words you want to say to Chris? Yes, I'm very worried about your mental health. Yeah, that's the disturbing <laughs> I'm talking about. I could have thrown you under the bus, but I didn't. I chose the high road. But it doesn't really help her case, but hey, no one says anything, of course. Mahmoud and his brother giggle about the girl from China because they don't respect Nicole's feelings. Why do they think it's funny? Monica comes in and plays victim. Why didn't you come? I I'm not gonna show up like that. I'm not gonna show up to your wedding crying. Mm, I'm sorry though. Jen randomly gets this wave of emotion out of nowhere and just calls Rishi and flips out on him. She thinks that I'm too old. F her. So f I ever hear her say that ever again? We will never speak again. Never. I'm never. Like, that was really just uncalled for. I don't know where that came from. And then we find out Jen gets Julian's number. What made you want to give your number to him? What's not to like about him? And Talon comes and they talk to him for a little bit. Talon, you messed up Johan's birthday party. <laughs> <laughs> What's up, Johan? And that was the tell-all. That was the tell-all. So, the unanswered questions and avoided topics. Let's talk about them. Danielle not telling Johan about her plan of wanting to move there. Why was that not acknowledged? I don't know. Literally anything about Chris. Chris's narcolepsy wasn't brought up. Her neck surgery, her back, her mint allergy, her knife collection, her rare motorcycle getting so stolen, her house burning down, her son going to jail, her pushing her wife, her diving into the pool neck first. <laughs> Duran, she should have been there. I would love to hear her opinion on anything. I don't know, I could literally talk about this all night. Look, I know it's not that serious. It's just reality TV. It's probably scripted, a lot of it anyway. The fact that I'm so invested in this is kind of embarrassing. I know, I know, you don't need to tell me, okay? And we're here and I just made a whole video on it and you just watched it, so bring it in. Look, TLC, if you guys are hiring, hit me up, send me a, a, an email, and I will help you hook this show up. Sean Robinson, we love you. You're gorgeous. But I think we need a new host. And I know TLC is probably in charge of what the host says, but we need someone who's going to dig in there, who isn't afraid of liabilities, who is not afraid to piss off Chris. We need someone that's going to give us a show because that's what it is. I think I've said all I needed to say. Let me know what your thoughts are, uh, if you enjoyed this season or if there's anything that I didn't go over. I intentionally skipped a few things just because, again, this video is already long. Again, I don't do commentary videos often, so if you enjoyed this, 
let me know. I might make more. If you didn't, then I'll just stick to what I usually do. That's fine. Well, my camera is about to die. I'm gonna go sing to a donkey. Bye. Birdie. Birdie. My birdie.